everyone, and welcome back to the SaaS developer community, where we talk about interesting technical topics for SaaS developers. And with me today, I have a very exciting guest. Uh, Andrew Atkinson is the author of the book, High Performance Postgres for Rails. And he managed to combine probably the two hottest topics for SaaS developers. Well, three, high performance and Postgres <laughs> and Rails. So super excited to have you here, Andrew. Thank you, Gwen. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And I've uh, just recently learned about your uh, SaaS developer community and excited to be part of that as well. I think you are a perfect fit for the community. And Thank people you. will really enjoy your content. So your book comes out as beta at the end of August, right? That's right. Yep. Been writing for about a year or so. We signed the kind of agreement for the book in early 2022. And so, yeah, we're coming up finally in the kind of home stretch now. And it's been quite a journey. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. How long have you been writing it for? Really? Um, so I also have a full-time job and I'm also a dad of a couple of young kids. So that's really, it's it's just kind of you know, I, I try to put in as much time as I can per week, but those with those time constraints, it's been about 15 months, I'd say, of of time total from going from the very beginning from nothing to having the first draft complete and then really going through and editing chapters and then getting technical reviewer feedback and that kind of thing. Yeah, this seems fairly typical. So Meanwhile, you also have a website where people can sign up to A, get notified when it's released, and B, also sign up to your mailing list. I heard you are sending Postgres tips. So if people, I think everyone always needs some Postgres tips. So it just makes sense to go and sign up. And I saw in your website that it says I will never spam. So. I see absolutely no downside for signing up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I hope that people uh, feel like they can sign up, even if it's just for a short period. And then, of course, they might want to unsubscribe. I know I add myself and remove myself from a lot of newsletters. And yeah, the main purpose is to tell people about updates about the book as it gets closer to publication. And then I am doing kind of like a hype building promo right now where um, I did keep track of all the extensions and Ruby gems that are mentioned throughout the book in a separate file. And there's a, a little more than 40 of them. And so those, those make up great content in the book. And I also want to really bring more attention to those open source projects so that the creators and maintainers can benefit from that as well. And what I'm doing is I'm just taking chunks of them, about 10 or so, and doing over a four-week period, a weekly email where I'm going to send out 10 of them in, in each email. Amazing. So if you like Postgres or you like Rails, you this is the place to get cool new information, tips, gems, etc. You also promised, and I'm getting it on the record, okay. that once the book is out in beta, you will have a special discount code for the SaaS developer community and you will post it in our Slack so people who hang out there will be able to go get high performance postgres with Rails and learn to build faster, build faster SaaS faster, I guess, is the point of high performance with Postgres and with Rails. Yeah, I think performance, you know, obviously you'd think about technical performance, like with the database, more queries per second or something like that. But there is like a, the book, you know, also using Ruby on Rails as a productivity oriented framework, there is occasional nods to developer productivity or team productivity as well. You don't want to be distracted by database migrations that go haywire. You know, you don't want to be distracted by adding a constraint and causing a, a table lock that ends up taking a lot of time away from your team and that kind of thing. So there's safeguards and parameter tunings and things like that, that are kind of like about your, your development velocity as well. Super but yeah, important. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Thank you. And I, I feel the same way. Definitely. There will be a discount code in the community. And like I mentioned, I'm excited to be in the community and I'm present in the Slack. So folks can hit me up if they'd like to, but yeah, I'll be happy to share 
that and and maybe we can even do like a little launch event or something like that oh yeah or like an open q a thread like i know on reddit a lot of people sometimes do like they ask me anything so yeah yeah that could be, be fun cool. yeah yeah we can do that uh, so let's go back to the beginning since you're combining two really interesting technologies into one book did your career start with rails or with postgres my career started with Rails prior to becoming a programmer that gets paid to write code and run things. Going way back into the 90s, I remember making my first websites and I've always <laughs> been like, you know, I'm going to date myself, but like in the mid 90s, like I had like Andy Land and Angel Fire. Like I, I remember using like <laughs> Angel Fire, like some of these really, th you know, these ancient, ancient things. I think growing up in the 90s and, you know, was always really fascinated by the internet and I did have some formal computer science instruction in university, but I always kind of wanted to build applications and web applications have that, you know, immediacy where you can build and, and make it online and anyone in the world can access it. That was always so exciting. I did have a brief detour where I built iPhone apps in the early 2010s and had an app in the app store. And that was a good experience, but I came, came back home to web applications and I mostly have worked with Ruby on Rails. I've also worked with some with Java, the language and some of the Java frameworks, but I've always kind of liked web applications. And then more recently, my career has shifted more towards the back end and more towards the infra side and more of a administrator and operator for Postgres databases. Yeah, I have to say that this is kind of an interesting combination because I would say that in every company that I've seen, the rail developers and the people who are responsible for the database performance, they don't always have this easy relationship. And it's not even always easy to make Rails developer really care about database performance. And yeah. here you are, a Rails developer who found himself caring about database performance. How did this happen? Yeah, it's a, a very reasonable question and because it is not that common. The easiest way to answer it, I think, and I, cause I thought about this myself too, is like, how did this happen? There actually was a point in time about two years ago when I kind of like a light, it was like a light switch kind of thing where I was like, Postgres is my future for my career. It's gonna be my specialization. And what I have found too, and other folks have written about this is there's kind of the theory side and, but there's also the opportunity to really put the skills into practice and both kind of aligned at the same time for me. So I was working for a startup company. They had experienced huge explosive growth in during the COVID pandemic as an educational tool, a web application and teachers all across the country and even the world were starting to use the tool. It was free. The stack was Ruby on Rails and a Postgres 10 database on AWS. And prior to me joining, they, they had their first kind of wave of the initial spring period when the pandemic had started in the school year was still in schools were starting to shut down and that kind of thing. I joined in the summer of that first year remotely, you know, working remote as a lot of us do. There was a lot of emphasis on preparing for what we expected to be the next wave, which was schools going back into session first year with the pandemic in place. And the way that that shook out was we had no DBA on our team. It was, it was a really small team, mostly rails application developers or like product developers. And we actually had vertically scaled all the way to the max instance class size available that AWS had for RDS, which That's is a huge, huge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we had a big budget. We were owned by a, a major company, so we had a lot of money, but we were actually at the highest instance class and given there was no DBA, looking back on it now, what I know about things now, there really were all kinds of maintenance things we weren't doing. I can get into more. Vacuuming. Vacuuming, vacuum. basically. <laughs> basically, that was our biggest problem. Let's talk about it more, but I realized I, I should just cut to the chase with answering your main question. So the main question is, essentially this, it, it felt a little bit like the seas had parted and there was this opportunity where it was like, let's let's do everything we can to make the application queries less costly, to make the database serve a higher volume of read and write queries. Let's do everything we can right now. We have about a month, you know? And yes. I picked up Postgres 
I bought a book myself called Postgres High Performance. It's based on Postgres 9. We were on 10. So the benefit of buying an old Postgres book, stuff doesn't change that much. And you can get it very, very inexpensively. The version 9 book you know, was very relevant, of course, with parameter tunings and different things that it had in there. I kind of immerse myself in the world of like, you know, what is auto vacuum? How do I tune? Which parameters are most important to tune? How do we actually start doing this? And so to answer your question, finally, um, I felt like, uh, there was a real opportunity and I felt supported on the team to do that. And, and, um, I just kind of took on becoming basically an application developer that now wanted to be the database guy, kind of. <laughs> yes. I really love how you jump into it as an opportunity to learn a lot and make a huge difference in a short amount of time, like the focus on results. Because I've seen other teams in very similar situation where you reach the maximum instant size and then you just say, oh, Postgres sucks. Let me move to whatever new database is cool at that point in time. Let's move to FoundationDB. Do I know anything about FoundationDB? No. Do I have any reason to believe that it will scale better? Well, Apple says that it scaled better for them, so let's try that. And it's it looks great on the resume. Like, hey, I introduced uh, FoundationDB to this company to deal with scale whether or not it actually solves a problem in the most efficient way possible. As you said, like you made huge improvements in a month. This is remain to be seen. Sometimes it works. It's like just a riskier bet. You took the more uh, low risk, but you made it highly rewarding uh, way to yeah. solve problems. Yeah. And we did have, it wasn't just me either. Of course, like there were other engineers on the team and then, um, we were part of a team within Microsoft and we had access to some folks from the Citus team and even uh, a core contributor to Postgres, a major contributor that uh, held an office hours within the company. And I started attending that as well. And I had the opportunity, I assumed that Microsoft is massive. Um, I assumed there'd be just like dozens of people in this office hours. And often there was just one person, it was just me. I would just join. And I'd say, hey, we're on this little team over here. We have this Postgres problem. What do you think? And um, we got some really, really great feedback that we could immediately put into use. A lot of it was tuning auto vacuum, running manual vacuums. You know, our, the common problem, and this has gotten better in newer versions of Postgres too, but the common problem is your very high update or delete tables are going to become, uh, the, the accumulation of dead rows is going to be so fast that auto vacuum, the vacuum that is running for those tables isn't going to keep up. So we did a lot of work on speeding that up so that it could keep up. And yeah. and yeah, I did view it as an opportunity, partly because it's kind of my personal developer brand too, I guess, is, is kind of trying to defer scaling as much as possible, you know, like solving things with money if the company can afford to vertically scale. Because ultimately, as the engineer that's operating the thing, I also want it to be somewhat simple. Like I want it to be I'd love to be able to understand everything in my head and, and, you know, when a problem crops up, like have a good idea of what it probably is and possibly try to reproduce it quickly and that kind of thing. And so I was a little reluctant to move to even, you know, suggest I didn't have the experience to say like, let's go to Citus, let's go to Yugabyte DB, let's go to Foundation DB or, you know, something else. I think the team, it also matched the team too. I think the team, you know, it's important to think as a developer on a team, kind of like what are the skill sets on the team and doing something that's within, I, I feel doing something within the realm of the team's skills as well. So, you know, jumping to a, a database that has better scalability properties maybe, or is distributed might make sense for one team member, but is that going to really be maintainable. What if that person leaves in a few months, you know, like, you know, like, um, so, you know, I think, I think being kind of responsible with the technology choices with the team and the budget and everything, it's all part of the decision-making. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you walked us through those different factors for making the decision. Now let's talk about the way people usually do Postgres and Rails. Like, one of the things that I think is always a point of concern is that Rails, big part of it is 
essentially being an ORM. Like you mm -hmm. define a bunch of objects and there is a lot of magic going on to translate the objects into tables, the operations into database queries. And this is usually like it, most of the time people would tell me, Gwen, if you want high performance, just don't use an ORM. This is step mm -hmm. number one of getting good performance out of a database. How did you square the circle? Um, well, I've never really been in a position to dictate we shouldn't use an ORM. I guess it's been a more of a gradual sell for developers to understand the SQL that is generated and determine if it needs to be rewritten and possibly written as SQL. And some of the engineers that I really looked up to earlier in my career, they also advocated SQL to me. The, the thing is, it's definitely um, a whole new skill set to learn if you're kind of normally an object-oriented programmer with a language like Ruby or Python or something like that. If you don't have a lot of familiarity with SQL, query execution plans, schema design, indexes, it's a lot, it's a lot of new stuff to learn. I could see some crack senior team of, of just kind of starting out and not really using any ORM. I've never really worked at startups where that's the case though, because usually teams are composed of a mix of experience levels and we might have earlier career or junior software engineers that are actually building a lot of the capabilities of the application, asking them to do advanced schema design or write advanced SQL queries, you know, sub queries and common table expressions and things like that. Like it might just be unrealistic compared with something that's much more friendly, like an active record object and Ruby code that they can run in a console and they can see how it works and, and that kind of thing. That, that being said in the book, I try to not be too opinionated as a software developer. I mean, I, I do have some opinions and I think I'm, I'm just more like, I will gladly share them with people I know well, but you know, maybe like in general audiences, I'm maybe a little more reserved. I tried to kind of take the perspective in the book of here's, here are things you can do at the active record layer without being judgmental about like, you know, you should write all, rewrite all of this as SQL queries directly. Uh, you know, it's like, here are common problems, excessive queries, you know, the N plus one problem. Here's what you need to do. You need to- I'm going your... to stop you right yeah. here because okay. people have been telling me N plus one problem basically <laughs> endlessly. Yeah. This may be a good time to admit that I don't know what they're talking about. Can yeah. you explain the N plus one problem and how do I recognize maybe I have this problem and I don't even know about it? Yeah, I would call it excessive queries. It's it's like if you have a parent object and you have a loop in code that you might write, like a, a procedural loop, like every blog post you want to get, or you want to get all the comments for every blog post. And so you have a HTML view that's being rendered where you say, um, you know, get each comment and within that loop, then let's say you, um, you don't query for those comments up front. within that loop of code, you query for like, you use that post identifier and then you query for its comments. And what that does is like, you might have one select query for, uh, a post and then let's see, what's a better example. You might have, um, a better example, I guess, would be within that comment, you might have a field on that comment that you want. And instead of um, capturing that field value for all the comments that are associated with that post, inside your loop, you might go and query the comment for that field. And so mm. the query pattern you'll see in your logs is like a top level post query and then a query per comment. And th that's, that's usually what people are talking about with the N plus one pattern. Um, sometimes people call it one plus N one person I worked with always oh, said that because it kind of makes more I sense. Guess, yeah. Yes. <laughs> now I understand because I couldn't figure out like why the name, like it always yeah. looks like it, because I'm doing one extra query, but then why would I care about the one extra? Now yeah. I understand the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I do think one plus N communicates more about the pattern, the query pattern yes. that you that is considered, you know, an excessive amount of queries. So the idea would be that instead you would, you would eagerly load or preload that in, in at least an active record speak, um, the comment data that you need in SQL speak, it might just be doing a select query for, um, all of the like comments maybe with 
uh, a range of values in an in clause for all the posts yeah. or um, yeah, probably something like that. It depends on how your, your schema is set up, of course, but, but yeah, so that's, that's a common problem. And it's so common that um, there's a number of third-party Ruby gems that you can install that will automatically detect it as you're just doing normal development, you know, it'll raise an exception and say N plus one detected. And in the newer versions of Ruby on Rails, there's even a new feature that allows developers to make it impossible to do that because there's a whole chapter on this, but the, the, the idea is that um, the feature is called strict loading and it allows developers to more or less annotate or decorate their code and say, for this particular call, uh, I only want strict loading. And what you do is you, you prevent eager loading or that kind of lazy loading that can occur, which is where the N plus one problem happens. Um, so that's something that's available in newer versions of Ruby on Rails, and it's it's still not as well known or adopted yet. So it's something that I mentioned in the book because I, I think it's a valuable tool. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes. And thank you for finally explaining to me what is the famous N1 problem. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciate that. So if I understand correctly what you're saying about active record as the main Rails ORM, is yep. that there's basically, if you can take the queries it does or change a bit, as you said, with annotations, the way it generates queries, make it more efficient without actually starting writing SQL yourself. Just add some indexes, deal with some locking and add some annotations. You're in a great place. Coding is still super easy and yeah. you just solved a bunch of performance problems. If this doesn't work, then you also have a bunch of advice on how to tell a active record how to run exact SQL because you've hand tuned it in exactly the ways that you believe is most performant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think, I think what I recommend, I said before, I don't really have opinions, but I do have some, I do have some <laughs> opinions I'll talk about, I guess. I mean, I do think active record, active record is the ORM framework that's always come with Ruby on Rails. And it's, it is conventionally how most Rails based development teams are going to write their queries and how they're going to modify their database schema using what Active Record calls migrations, which are yes. the kind of like incremental changes to a, a database schema, um, and the the benefit of that is you're going to have um, very very conventional ways of writing, essentially writing read and write queries to your database using Ruby code that's going to be, you know, easier to test with and more accessible to folks that are either newer to Ruby on Rails or newer to Ruby or both or that kind of thing. And it is very readable, you know, it's, it's easier to maintain, I would say, than I've never really maintained a big application with lots of SQL queries or like snippets of queries or clauses, but uh, Active Record has patterns for all these things. So if you want to have, uh, you know, a, um, a clause, like a where clause that's common to a lot of tables, there's a, a thing for that called named scopes. So you can yeah. drop it into um, a particular model that represents a table, or you can share it across models with a Ruby module, that kind of thing. And I think that way it really is more maintainable. And I think the next, you know, to get going. And then at the point where you start to have some query problems, I think the most important thing is to be able to take a look at what SQL is running and be able to connect it back to where it's running. And I talk about how to I show an example of how to do that in the book and use your logs. And then at that point, you can say, can we improve this query to where it's good enough and we can move on? Or does this actually need to be rewritten? If you decide you want to even rewrite it as SQL, you can do that with Active Record as well. Active Record lets you just take just write SQL as a string inside of an active record call. And that's an option as well. Yeah. And there's a lot of benefits for using all those pre-existing patterns, right? I mean, new developers in the team, if they know Ruby, they will be familiar with the scope. So they don't have to figure out the weird ways that your particular project does stuff. And right. also every gem that you use will probably be way easier to integrate if you are sticking to standard patterns. Yeah, and even sharing within code bases within companies, I've done that too, like multiple Rails applications. You might say, we're going to take this functionality, package it up as a Ruby gem, 
run it in both of our Rails apps. And uh, if it, the more that you use conventional active record code, the easier it will be to make that kind of thing portable between the apps. Yeah. So one problem that is very specific to SaaS products is the thing that you basically have one application running for many customers, meaning yep. that there will be many customers who need the exact same set of tables, exact same queries. This is basically what every single SaaS in the world looks like. And the way it translates to database, there's basically this eternal debate. Do I give everyone their own database? Do I give them their own schema? Do I collocate them and just share the same set of tables between everyone? And it just keeps going on and on. Is there a particular one of those approaches that just works way better with Rails that you recommend for people who get started? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to get started is is a, uh, all of your customers are in the same database. I mean, you know, that's that's probably not just for Rails. That's, I imagine that's for any kind of framework is if you have a SaaS application and you have some way to identify your customer, like a customer ID, tenant ID, account ID, something like that. Um, if it works for your company and your team to have that data uh, co-located in the same database, that's just going to be the, this, um, and, and you aren't even at a point yet where you're needing to do like read, write splitting and have like a read replica for queries. Uh, you just have one database that you read and write to. That's kind of the <laughs> Life easiest easy way mode. to get started. Yeah. Yes. Easy mode. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think what, where I work now though, we don't, we, we do not run on easy mode, uh, and I, I have developed a good appreciation for, you know, the kind of maintenance that is involved in even just running at a certain point. If you say for this customer, we don't want to run them in the same database. We want to run them as a separate database. Now you have to choose either. Do you run another database that the application talks with, which you can do with rails, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment or what the company I've done has done before I joined um, was uh, to create an entirely separate deployment, you know, basically a, a single customer environment, full stack, like all of the bits. And um, in that case, you can just deploy, it's, it makes some yeah. things easier. Of course, it makes a lot more cost because you're, you're possibly running duplicate pieces of your stack, like databases or, um, you know, EC2 servers or, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's a lot of duplication that is, um, not really utilized well, but you have this situation where the application still is just talking to one database. It's just an entirely separate deployment. And so that does make it easier in terms of the, um, the separation. You don't really need to be a, a database whiz to determine how are you going to split out this customer from your existing monolithic database, for example. What, what I like though, is, um, this scenario where, you know, for certain customers where they don't necessarily need, um, their own dedicated infrastructure, um, running a second dedicated database just for that customer that the application talks with. And so that would be like, you know, database level tenancy, and you'd want to, there's a couple examples in the Ruby on rails world. There's some Ruby gems that help facilitate this, where you might have your customer have their own subdomain for your web application, like customer.company.com, and use that as kind of a routing key. So when requests come in, uh, identify the customer and you know which database to read and write to, and then make that sticky for, for, the, for that uh, requests that are similar to that. Um, and Active Record actually in Currently, the major version that's released is seven, and in version six, which was released a few years ago, they added for the first time support for multiple databases directly with Active Record. So prior to that, you need to use a Ruby gem that would help you manage the configurations and know which kind of like how to set up your code so it would know where to read and write to. And multiple databases was a really big, you know, was a really big feature addition to the framework directly because. Um, they kind of enabled, they made it a little easier to enable a lot of use cases like uh, read write splitting, you know, where you have a, a writer database and a reader, 
And then the, this use case that I'm mentioning now, where you might run a customer on their own database that has the same schema, but is completely isolated from the other database. Yeah. So you mentioned there are some helpful Ruby gems and you just mentioned that you have this collection of 40 Ruby gems that are super useful. Uh, can you name drop a few that like would be particularly helpful for SaaS developers working with uh, Postgres? Um, it's funny because the first one I think of is not actually mentioned in the book at all, because what I recommend is is folks use the active record capability for multiple databases. So there isn't another gem needed for that. It's because it's built into active record. Um, I know that there are folks that use the Ruby gem called acts as tenant. It's like, uh, there's kind of this gem naming convention. Let me just double check that I have that name correct. Uh, um, acts as used to be popular with Ruby gem, uh, gem names. Yes. Um, but yeah, that I do have that name correct. So that's one. That's a, a third-party gem you could use regardless of your um, Rails version, or it may work, in other words, on older versions of Rails, where if you want to do a uh, tenancy, it, it'd be worth looking into. Um, however, I do. Uh, there is a chapter uh, covering how to do customer isolated databases with a Rails application in the book, and I do recommend folks look at Active Record if they can, if they're newer is where they introduced something called where, where this this capability is supported and they actually call it um, something they'll search for is called horizontal sharding that's what active record calls it where the idea is you have the same schema so yeah. you have you know rows that would have otherwise been in your main database now are in a separate database in a customer specific database that's where the the uh, horizontal comes in like the row level but same schema um, but now that rails supports multiple databases, you can even take it further and you can start to split out, you know, different schema databases. You can yes. vertical so, sharding. Yeah. Yeah. So vertical. And I don't know that that's, it, it might be relevant to SAS developers in that, you know, and this is something actually we're starting to explore where I work now is there might be some functionality that. Um, you know, if you're building a monolithic application that really makes sense for all customers, but if you start to do the split out, you might want to say, you know, something that might, might be extracted as a whole service, but maybe you want to leave in the application for easier deployments and management, less overhead. You might want to actually split out kind of a functional shard or a grouping of tables that has functionality that's going to be useful to all customers. And you can do that with Rails with the built-in uh, multiple databases as well. Nice. Yeah. So you can do everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so simple. Yes. And I... there are some examples um, like uh, Notion, uh, the popular whatever it is, wiki kind of thing. Uh, yeah. we, you know, my company uses it. I use it every day. Um, they have, I believe, Notion and Figma, another a design tool. I believe they both have... Um, public engineering blog posts about how they used Ruby on Rails and uh, Postgres, and they're doing functional kind of or application level sharding like that. Amazing. Yeah. We need to do a case study. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned other, like another common pattern in Postgres, which was the read-only replicas is yep. the kind of first step as you're starting to think about scaling out. Is there, are there some gems that support read-only replicas? Uh, well, the one, yeah, we do use one uh, where I work now. We're not using um, Rails to do this, although um, I think we could move to that. But we use one called MultiDB. Uh, let's see, let's check who makes that. Um, looks like the GitHub handle is called Out of Order. Uh, and the way that that works is it is explicit. You have to do explicit configuration. So in your Ruby code, you know, and again, this kind of depends on which database technology uh, we run on AWS and with RDS um, replica lag can be a thing, you know, depending on yes. what's happening on your primary database and depending on there could be a scenario where if your queries are on a replica and the replication lag is so high, it's, it's either an actual error or it's perceived as an error if data yes. isn't replicated yet. And there's some patterns like read your own writes um, yeah. where you would still read on the primary and that kind of thing. 
So However, MultiDB just gives it to you? Well, no, with MultiDB, <laughs> we do, it does have a, like a failover option. I believe that's built into the gem. So they call it failover. It's, it's databases. People would think of failover as a little bit different. This just means basically saying, you know, is my data on the replica? It's not, is it on the primary in this mm -hmm. case? Um, that capability I think is built into MultiDB, but with, um, you do need to configure you basically what you do is you say this query, I want to run on the replica and you actually need to write a little bit of code that just surrounds that code in a Ruby block. That's like, you know, kind of says run this on the replica, but that fallback could be built in. One thing that's cool that rails uses, I don't know how many organizations really use this. I'd love to hear about real world usages, but they actually do an automatic, let's see, what is it called? What it is, is it will, it'll try to automatically, it tries to help you write less code, less uh, configuration code where you'd say, I want this to run on the replica by letting you, if you choose to opt into this, letting, because you know the HTTP request coming into the application, when it's a get request or a head request, then what Active Record lets you do is say, this this can go to the replica. So it's gonna try the replica for those uh, requests. And um, the benefit of that is you don't need to manually configure your code to say, run this code on the replica. So if you have it configured, both a reader and a writer or a primary and a replica, um, Rails, in theory, can help you automatically distribute your, your load between those two um, without you needing to necessarily configure that yourself. Amazing. That's really cool. So, so there's another um, Postgres feature that I heard is fairly commonly used in um, SaaS um, products, I guess. And that's uh, the row level security. Is that something you, you try? Do, do you even give advice in the book? I heard that it, not used correctly, it may cause serious performance issues. It's not in the book. And actually, coincidentally, I'm using it at uh, where I work now. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I did. What I actually need to determine myself is what that overhead is, because my understanding is you add a policy per table and there's a little bit of query overhead that that adds then because it needs to be checked, like the policy. Um, and um, on a live, highly, you know, high query volume, um, application, I'd be a little hesitant to just add it without understanding what that latency looks like. So regarding role level security, there is no direct support for it in active record. And I'm actually not aware of any Ruby gems. It's, it feels like an opportunity though. It, it definitely yeah, right? feels like, yeah, it, it definitely does. And, and it could be just that I don't know that there are gems that exist, but it's a, it's schema information that you would put into Postgres. Active Record has migrations where you do that. You know, you create tables, you add indexes, you um, you can add constraints. So it's it could just be another thing. And actually, um, you know, you and I were talking about questions a bit before this, and um, that is something I was kind of considering. Is like, as far as one of your questions was, are there future things that I would look forward to, or any ideas yeah. for the future? It would be kind of interesting for Active Record to support role level security and. Active Record supports Postgres, MySQL, and SQLite. Um, so I don't know if there are equivalent row level securities and policies in those other relational databases. Um, that would be a possible blocker. But in those cases, what I've tend what I tend to see is, you know, Ruby, the kind of Ruby gem community creating something that might be specific to Postgres, but it could extend Active Record. So it could say like a Ruby method that's like add policy. You know, you give it the table name and you give it a SQL query that um, expresses the definition of your policy. And I think that could be really cool to bake into the application as another database capability that you can take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah, it's Our, nice how flexible it is. Um, one of the challenges, so there, there's also an interesting rabbit hole to go down of how you, you know, which database role your application uses to access the database and um, whether or not, you know, if you follow a principle of least privilege, like whether or not you want your, your application user to be able to, you know, drop tables and things like that. Cause usually it does need to, like if you do kind of normal database schema management from the application, you normally need to do that. But um, with role level security, 
I coincidentally had been working with a tool recently called PG Copy DB. And the creator, Dimitri, I was discussing on GitHub what uh, it, it, it's actually a really, really awesome tool for any listeners that need to copy a Postgres database. I highly recommend it. Um, it, it does, it basically bakes in all the best practices for row copying as fast as possible, not creating any indexes or constraints on the destination side, creating them later. Mm. It navigates, uh, primary yeah. key, foreign key relationships. It, it works really well. And it's, it does like, um, it's written in C and it, it runs very fast and, Unfortunately, it doesn't, it's like 95% of what we need, but the 5% that it doesn't have out of the box as of today is means we can't use it right now. Um, <laughs> and the part that it's missing is it doesn't have like a row level filtering concept. It does have a filter concept, but that's more like if you want to give it a database uh, object configuration, you can say only copy the tables in the schema or something like that but it doesn't have a role level concept. And so Dimitri suggested, what about role level security using that? And we're kind of looking into that now, but the, the general problem that we're solving, which probably, which could be a thing for a lot of listeners of this uh, group is there are some cases where we want to take a customer's data that exists in a database that has other customer data. Like, you know, in other words, they don't have their own, they're just in our multi-tenant or what we call our multi-tenant application. They don't have their own customer environment or their customer database. We want to, we basically want to move their data for different reasons. It could be that we're creating a separate testing environment or a staging environment for them with just their data. And we don't want to have any data from other companies in that environment. We could be moving them to a new geo. Like if we have a, um, the company I work for, we do have a presence in, we have customers in the United States and customers in Europe and other countries. And so we have, um, AWS region presences in, you know, EU and the United States. And, um, as we have grown as a company and we've created new geographic presences, sometimes it makes more sense to move a customer to a geo that makes more sense for them. In that case, we need to slice out all of their data and then move them into either the appropriate multi-tenant or a customer isolated database in that geo. So that's where the way that we've done that as a company and other engineers before me, and now I'm kind of getting rolled into that is we have a lot of, we basically have migration scripts that are shell scripts and SQL queries that take data out of a database that's for a particular customer. And um, the, if that part, if there was a ability to configure that with PG copy DB, we could use it off the shelf, but I'm kind of a uh, hand rolling. We're, we're kind of gluing together our SQL scripts and then possibly with PG copy DB to make it easier to isolate and then move a database. So that was kind of a rabbit hole of, uh, yeah, no, this is super interesting because yeah, I'm, my bet is that PG copy DB uses the Postgres copy command which mm -hmm. famously has limitations on the ability to filter rows. Uh, so it makes sense that they, and, uh, and tools that uses that, I mean, it's extremely efficient. So I can see why it's a extremely fast tool, but it would inherit this uh, exact limitation. This is something that uh, I've run into as well. Uh, so, yeah. Another, th okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um... Dimitri has a great presentation this year from CytusCon where he introduces the tool. And um, besides copy command, uh, PG dump and PG restore are used as well. And there, there's as much, I think, native or, you know, Postgres client code as is reused as possible. And a lot of inspection of the catalogs and stuff like that. Yeah. Makes um, sense. We talked a lot about like, you know, normal use cases, what normal people do where is in their normal day-to-day -day SaaS lives. Uh, but I've seen some of your talks and I know you've solved some very large scale, very hairy problems in your previous job. So I'm curious if you can kind of tell us of like an ex extreme performance problem and the way you approached it. Um, 
Yeah, well, I, at my last job, which was not a SaaS company, it was more of a consumer-oriented yeah. company. So that we had this high scale. And actually, I was grabbing some numbers before. So we had, this is again that Rails app with Postgres 10 database on regular RDS, not Aurora. We knew this load was coming, so I was actually grabbing some some data. Our highest request per minute, which is its main metric in New Relic, was around 50,000 RPM. So it was around 800 requests a second. And at our peak, we hit like 550,000 RPM, which is around 9,000 requests a second. So, Ooh. and we were a team of less than 10 developers at that point with no DBA. So it was, it's a lot of load. On a you know, single making, instance. Single instance. Yeah. But it, and also again, we actually downgraded, I think, to the non-top class. We actually were able to, I think after a number of modifications, go down one instance class level. But now I know AWS offers instances with even more. You can get into the terabytes of RAM. But <laughs> insane the, the terabytes the, of RAM. That that's crazy. Sorry. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. I was I was reading even I think this year possibly they're gonna launch even up to twenty four terabytes. I think um I think reinvent maybe they'll launch new instance classes or something like that. But so you know, the other thing that I took away from that though was like, wow, you can do a lot on a single Postgres instance. And yeah. And, and a, a really big shout out to the team before me, because honestly, I'm not going to take credit for this, but the average, I wrote this down to average response time, web application, again, Ruby on Rails takes a lot of heat from people, but 35 milliseconds, it's, was the average response time at 8,000 requests, 9,000 requests a second. So the and, average response time for a query or like the entire request, including the time going through the Ruby application and everything? Yeah, the latter, the entire, the, the whole time involved from, you know, parsing like the HTTP request coming into the controller, doing its thing in the database, making the query, generating the API response, usually a JSON response, 35 yeah. milliseconds. And I think that is, that's a, that's a key to how you can achieve a high scale on a single instance of, you know, of course, like with your, uh, besides splitting your reads and writes and that kind of thing. Um, and of course, like as with most web applications, they are more read oriented. So you definitely want to, uh, you know, split out reads to a, a read replica where you can. And of course, like you can horizontally scale that too, or you can have multiple read replicas. Wait, I feel like I missed the good part. Okay. You said the key for scaling out on scaling on a single instance. And what is the key? Well, I, I, I shouldn't say like the sole, <laughs> the singular key. I mean, one of the keys is, you know, you can achieve a higher request volume if your average response time is lower, you know? So, I mean, you know, yes. yeah. Just... Now, how do I achieve the lower response time? <laughs> okay. That's the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, first of all, you got to buy my book and then, so, <laughs> but I mean, um, in, in more seriousness, it's, it's really performance engineering, you know, I would say, and it, it like with, I'll be honest too, like at least I'm, I'm biased to where I work now, but with a, a business to business software as a service application, it can be a tough sell to really invest down to the request level compared with a consumer application where you might not really have a choice. You might have your hand forced, you know, um, because you might say, oh, we need, we have these very spiky or very bursty workloads. And if our queries take a second or five, you know, if they're really slow, they take five seconds or something like that. That's not acceptable. Like we're not going to be able yeah. to achieve a certain level of, of, um, request volume on that same instance, we're going to have to scale up or that sort of thing. So, but yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, understanding what queries are running, running any query that can be run on a replica, um, running that, uh, there. Um, and then of course, like getting into the queries and analyzing the queries themselves, looking at the execution plan, making sure that indexes are used, you know, it's possible. We could also talk about table partitioning, but yeah, it's, it's hard to answer that question briefly, but yeah, it's really it's like, so broad. Yes. it's, it's like performance engineering, starting from the application working. I, I think it makes sense to start from application queries and then go into the database and look at queries kind of from the other side. And in the book, we look at PG stat statements and look at 
the um, the query volume and kind of order it by your worst queries, the queries that are the most costly and trying to attack those. That will give you more throughput on the same instance if you can knock those down. Um, and then um, more advanced techniques like being able to kind of control your data growth by using table partitioning. Uh, that's something that's explored later in the book also. So a scenario that is super common in SaaS applications. Let's say I was asked to add a new feature. I added it. It obviously has some new queries on the database. I ran it in my staging environment, looked at all the query times, as you said, like PG stats, all those things. Everything looked fine. Everything looked extremely fast. Deployed it to production and boom, there is this one customer with slightly different data pattern that is for this one customer, everything is slow <laughs> yep do you have tips on how do you catch it how do you tune when you have like one customer who is this outlier yeah we do have that where i work as well and some of those customers are on their own dedicated infrastructure which i think was partly a business solution just to um allow that to be scaled independently you know like if Sometimes you can solve performance through hardware, but it's not and, and in this not case, it's basically shard or as we're coming back to yeah, more customer to sharding. sharding. Yeah. Yes. Um, if you know if if a business can absorb those cloud costs and that engineering time to separate that and run that, and if you know it's gonna force your hand into making sure that you have infrastructure as code, you have repeatable deployments, you have, you know of course, like good CI that you can release regularly and you know, all that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not really directly addressing the cause, but it's like kind of looking at the symptom and saying we can separate or isolate this customer into their own deployment or possibly their own database. And then we can scale that independently. Um, a separate database on the same instance can't be scaled separately with Postgres. You still have instance level resources, you know, CPU, memory, and disk. So that's where, um, that would be more for data isolation, but not necessarily for performance scalability reasons. Um, you have to move them to their own instance and, yeah. uh, that, that'd be one option as far as like within the database though, you know, one thing that just comes to mind off the top of my head would be more configuration probably to add heavier limits or throttling for that particular noisy customer mm, it might be like a new feature you develop right yeah maybe like you know pagination of of maybe they have just a lot yeah. more data than every other yeah. customer because they're a heavier yeah. user yeah you're making a really good point that a lot of database problems can be addressed by writing slightly different code by actually application level patterns. That's my uh, secret sauce as a developer is like, <laughs> I'll, I, I don't really think as a, as a, well, I shouldn't admit this on air, but I, I usually think, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think as an engineer, but that's not really even true. And that's like selling myself short. I am, I do think as an engineer, but I also think as a user experience or like a product experience, would it be acceptable to just make a product change here? Like if it's not going to really disrupt the customer and it's going to completely obviate or invalidate the performance problem, that's a win. Yeah. So, yeah, like, ab so absolutely. It, it might be like a, you know, and, and nobody wants to deal with like a excessive configuration, you know, so it's a balancing act. You can't have everything configurable. Um, you know, you want to have smart defaults and, and that kind of thing too. But yeah, but as you mentioned some things that are just very obvious, like pagination is... Yeah. A well a well known pattern, and like if you have had large an, customers, you need it. We had an example recently where we were dealing with our actually our biggest customer yet. Very exciting for the company. Um, I can't really name them publicly, but it's a it's a company you definitely uh, know and interact with on a near daily basis indirectly, and um, be, unless you know because of their presence in the United States and. Um, they they have just a lot they they use our platform to conduct their hiring and they have a lot more data than really most any other customer um from what i've seen and that is both in their number of users that use the, the platform concurrently 
well, just in general, but also concurrently, which causes a lot of trouble. Um, we, you know, it's when you have a whole like global workforce that suddenly is using your app at the same time, that's actually a lot of load that, uh, <laughs> um, might not have been, you know, for admin side functionality might not have been really stress tested much before. And, um, you know, like one small application spot that we had that I think is a general pattern is, you know, or could be a general pattern for listeners is a spot that really wasn't, there was no limit on the query that was trying to show, you know, objects in a list. So a table was rendered. First problem was the client side, just the client side rendering was just killing the browser just because it was like, you know, thousands of objects to load in the browser. And what we could do was just add a, a SQL limit to that query to start. And part of the reason it was easy to do that is because we also had a search feature. So there's kind of a pattern, I think, of like anything that's unbounded, adding a bound on it, it's going to, maybe it's going to save you just from that one particularly big customer. But if it doesn't really block them from using the app the way they were and other customers, like I think that limit is fine. And could be configurable. Um, and then the other thing is if you want to expose lots of data beyond what you might show as kind of one page of data add a search feature, you know, and allow people to do their own kind of searching or exploration. Yeah. Thank you. This is fantastic. I mean, I'm just, you dropped so many useful patterns and useful tips and I'm guessing your book has way more. So I know we planned more topics of conversation, but we are at the hour. Okay. Uh, so I want to thank you for the ama really amazing conversation. I hope most people made it this far and learned everything you had to share. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Gwen. And I'm excited to keep uh, contributing to the community and um, hope to uh, stay in touch with you and help uh, more folks out and learn from them as well. Thank you. Yeah. And everyone who loved this, definitely go get a book. I'll make sure this is the URL. Go grab it, uh, sign up, get notifications, get a book. If the book is basically the same of what I learned in the last hour, but more, then it's going to be, I'd say, life changing. I don't know about <laughs> that, but no, I, I, I did try to really bake in a lot of um, examples from my work experience, which is about 15 years as building web applications. So I do hope, and it's, it's experience I've had, and I've learned from others, uh, other senior engineers as well. So I hope people find it at least, uh, very practical and a lot of examples and exercises they can put to use right away. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks.